When we think about war, we think about bullets and blood, death and destruction. We think about explosions, about soldiers and brotherhood. We have all seen the movies. There are just certain things we know to be true about war. Death, blood, gore, pain. There are no winners in war. Some just lose less than others. World War II was probably the most devastating. I think more people died at D-Day on June 6th in 1945 when they invaded Normandy and so forth. I believe they lost like 50,000 troops, 50,000. You know, they saw things that you'd never seen before in your life, and devastation and violence. World War II kind of disrupted everything for my family. My three brothers, uh, the oldest brothers, one joined the Air, Air Corps. It was then the Air Corps, not the Air Force and one joined the Navy and one joined the Army. This is the Battle of China. This, the great city of Shanghai on a September day in 1937. This, the fearful beginning of a new kind of war. This, the first mass bombing from the air of a helpless civilian population. By occupying Manchuria in September of 1931, Japan violated the Nine Power Treaty, one of the three treaties of the Washington Naval Conference. The Nine Power Treaty summarized the open door policy, which declared China a neutral trading ground for any nation. Manchuria was subsumed into the Japanese domain and renamed Manchukuo. However, the United States was in the midst of the Great Depression and foreign affairs proved not to be a priority. In 1933, Adolf Hitler rose to the head of the Nazi party and removed Germany from the League of Nations. Also withdrawing from the League, Japan renounced the Washington Treaties in 1936 and seized China. In an attempt to remain equitable, the United States formed the Neutrality Acts, which prohibited the aiding of any nation at war, including the sale of weaponry and the lending of currency. On September 1, 1939, the Germans occupied Poland, and shortly after, England and France declared war. It was, I was a kid, it was fun, you know. The southwest side, 71st and Western uh, Marquette Park, it's called. It was a melting pot of various ethnic groups, Lithuanian, Italian, German, Irish. For two years, the United States persisted in neutrality until France was overcome by Nazis and Great Britain's navy was at the risk of being conquered by Hitler, which would render the Atlantic a useless barricade between American soil and the war. After Japan's incursion into Indochina, U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull demanded Japan leave China and Indochina. When the war started was December 7th, 1941. I was nine years old. I was home. We were uh, all my brothers, and those are the ones that were older. Naturally, I have four other brothers, one still living. We had 
a big household. We had about 11 people living in our house at the time. Two weeks later, on December 7, 1941, Japan answered the demand with two raids on the American naval base in Hawaii. The Japanese mercilessly assailed an American base, demolishing 18 American vessels, destroying 187 planes, and killing over 2,000 of our men. I don't think I realized the impact of it as such until I got older. The strike on Pearl Harbor was so devastating, so destructive, that all hopes of United States neutrality was obliterated. On December 8, 1941, the United States declared war on Japan. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Great change has taken place. China is now our fighting ally. Or more accurately, we are China's. Uh, everyone wanted to go join the service. My three brothers, one was a medic, one was on a tanker, as a matter of fact, delivering oil and fuel to the other services around the Caribbean and so forth. Matter of fact, he had two tankers shot out from under him. He still survived. They all, all my brothers survived, but they all got wounded heavily. We are sympathetic to the soldiers, our own imaginations unable to fathom the horrors they must have encountered, the pain and loss they must have endured. But sometimes we forget to extend our sympathy to the families. In a way, they suffer the most. Every goodbye marks the beginning of a great sacrifice. Every moment must be appreciated because there is no guarantee that they will come home. Families of the soldiers give up their peace of minds in order to provide the nation with security. They sacrifice their time with their son or daughter, brother or sister, husband or wife. They say their goodbyes in airports, hoping that hug won't be the last, and praying they make it home in one piece. They spend their days racked with worry for their brave soldier, wishing they were home instead of at war. There's a saying that goes, you don't know what you have until you lose it. We often take for granted the simple comfort of being surrounded by our loved ones. Mothers put their heart and soul into raising their children to be the better versions of themselves. They invest their whole lives into raising their child. Sending them off to fight in a war takes strength and courage, faith and sacrifice. Women like Anna Cosgrove, Bob's mother, have the strength to keep moving even after losing so much. It's more of a trial and tribulation, really, for my mother, was what it was. Fear can be crippling, but these mothers continue to function. Anna not only functioned, she supported her family despite seemingly constant loss following her around every day. She was a very strong woman. Uh, she sent three boys away for, to war. She lost her husband, my father lost her mother, her brother, her sister, all in a matter of about three years. With a deceased husband and three boys off at war, Anna sent her youngest son to school in Kentucky and her second youngest to work. My father was in one hospital, I was in another hospital. I was a very young man. He died in 1943, so I was just 10, going on 11, when he passed away. So it became very difficult for her. She went to work in uh, the Dodge plant, which is a, was a factory producing war materials for the effort. 
used to be called a Ford, Ford City it's called now. I went to school. <laughs> My brother had to take responsibility as he was older. He went to work for Transworld Airlines, TWA. And I went to an all boys school, St. Joseph Preparatory School. But the exciting part was there were three all girls schools there. I, here you came. And we were the only boys in town and such, so. Friday night and Saturdays were very nice. <laughs> Dancing and going to the movies and so on. Looking back on it many years later, I thought my mother had to do something with me because my other brother was old enough to work and be by himself. He was three, four years old, almost four years older than I. So at that time he was 17 or 18 years old and I'm, I'm 13 or 14. So in order for her to function, uh, she put me in a boarding school. At that time you were able to go to service, if you had a, a group of friends from the neighborhood, I could go with you and you and you and you, and we could all go together. Well, when they had a, a problem with, I believe it was the Sullivan boys who were sunk in a ship, I don't know if they're five or seven, they were killed all at once. They decided that no brothers or, would go together, or no friends would go together, they'd split them up. I miss my brothers, you know, they used to write. We didn't have email then, <laughs> or texting, you know, but no, we, uh, it became a problem uh, as far as just missing your family. Families settle for relationships through letters, and even then conversations are censored. They don't know where their soldiers are or when they'll hear from them. They simply wait for the mail to come and pray it will be news of their safety. You know, one time I remember my mother got a telegram of my, for my one brother, my brother Dick, Richard. He had, uh, they said he was wounded and missing in Wake Island. Wake Island was one of the major battles of the Pacific. However, he was not on Wake Island, he was on what Watke Island, which is W-A-T-K-E. So it was a misprint or a telegram from, of the wrong information. So that, that I remember was very traumatic for her, thinking he was killed. I say my mother had a, had a knife made for him because they didn't issue him a knife. They had his name inscribed and his number and so forth and his identification and he sent it back because it wasn't properly made and they asked him why there had to be a groove in the blade because otherwise he could only use it once he couldn't pull it out so that's devastating to think that that's what he had to have to survive. I don't know if he ever used it or not. I, don't, I really don't care to know. <laughs> Families used to hang a flag in their window called the sun and service flag with a blue star in the center. Different symbols and colors represented different statuses like wounded or missing. The flag was a reminder to the community to be thankful for their loved ones because the Blue Star Mothers had only the flag to hold on to until their return. The Gold Star meant that the soldier died in service. Those mothers were referred to as Gold Star Mothers. Oh, it devastated them. It devastated them. And you had flags with sons in the service and daughters and some were gold stars, so they lost somebody. I'm very traumatic. Like I say, I didn't think it was that traumatic for me until now.
Well, the one brother in the Air Corps, he, yes, he was, and I can't give you much information, he was 17 years my senior. Uh, he received uh, two Purple Hearts, actually, wounded a couple times. He left the Air Corps with uh, a bullet still lodged in his spine that couldn't be operated on for fear he'd be paralyzed. And the next brother, my brother Dick, who was in uh, the Army, he was in the medic, medical corps. He was wounded very severely. He had, matter of fact, he was still getting oak leaf clusters on his bronze star. Pardon me. <laughs> it's been so long ago, I didn't think I'd get emotional. Years later, he had like four, five bronze stars. Hmm. And my other brother, Bill, who was in the Navy, he got two, uh, I know he had two Purple Hearts also. So yeah, they did a lot. The relief families must feel when their soldier comes home is unimaginable. The crippling fear that you could lose a loved one just melts away. For the first time since they left, you finally feel like you're standing on stable ground. Oh, it was nothing but party, party, party. It was fun, you know, everything. Thank goodness everyone's coming home. But when they get home, soldiers have to carry their stories around. Stories that might remind them of all that they have sacrificed, of all that they have lost. Stories that might haunt them. Of course, there are some stories that make them smile, some that remind them of their friends, their brothers, the camaraderie that kept them going. Some soldiers keep all of the pain and grief to themselves. A lot of them don't want to share their nightmares. Uh, my second oldest, or Dick, the one who was in the medics, talked to me about it a few times and tried to teach me some judo, which he did a pretty good job. So watch it, Kate. But eventually the soldiers and the families have to move on. Their lives continue and all they can do is try to forget the hard times and focus on their better days. Although the wars are different, the stories are different, and our country is different, soldiers remain the same. Through all the fighting and fear, they make friendships that will stay with them forever. They form a brotherhood that no one else can understand. There's that saying, you have to walk a mile in someone's shoes to understand what they're going through. They share stories and perspectives that the rest of us can't relate to. Their friendships mean more. I recall one particular instance. At that time, my mother had a dress shop at 55th and Ashland Avenue in Chicago. And she called one of my brother's friends Phil, Phil Schmidt, I believe his name was, and said, come on over, Phil, I, I have something for you. And they served in the, in the service in the Pacific uh, together, actually. They saw each other over there. They, he saw my brother when he was wounded. The last time he saw him, they were carrying him down the hill, and he was going up the hill. They called, she called him, and he came over, and my brother walked out from behind the, the back room, and this Phil Schmidt, big soldier, passed out. He fainted away. He said, my God, I thought you were dead, Wink. And he said, I thought you were dead. Huh. Bring him back a lot of memories. The families also remain the same. They all experience the heartache and the fear. They experience the loss. The only realization that I had was the fact that it destroyed, it helped destroy our family as such, or move everyone apart. I thought many times, I don't know how she survived. 
being left with two children after having 11 people in the house as such, you know. That had to be totally devastating for her. But she survived, she went through it, you know. She lived, as a matter of fact, she just passed away in 1983, so she lived till she was about 87, I think, or 89. War challenges everyone, the soldiers, the families, and the communities. You know, you're not always gonna make the right decision. Like I say, President Truman at the time, I thought had the hardest job going. Why anyone wants that job is beyond me, because no matter who gets it, they're criticized. But to make that decision to drop a bomb not one, but two, and that's the only two we had. That's the only two we had at the time. If they would have kept coming, they being the Axis or J Japanese, Germans, uh, we wouldn't be talking here. So he made a major decision, and he took a lot of flack for it, probably rightfully so in some cases, but it all depends on whose bull's being gored. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. The movie's depiction of war is gory and dramatic, with involved plot lines and heartbreaking stories meant to fill you with sorrow. But war is so much more than that. It's complicated and messy. People make decisions, good and bad. Soldiers lose parts of themselves in war, physically and psychologically. And families lose parts of themselves too, Fear and heartbreak will do that. So war is gory and dramatic and tragic. It is not black and white, and the lines are not always clear. The good guys are not on one side with the bad guys on the other. There is no obvious divide between the two. Both sides make decisions that hurt people, and both sides make decisions that destroy lives, on the war front and at home. We recognize the valor in our soldiers, but we sometimes overlook the bravery demonstrated in the families left at home. In war, everyone contributes, everyone hurts, and everyone sacrifices. I came into this class as a new student and I've been a new student before and I know how hard it is to make friends and to feel like you're a part of something. It was easy to bond with the kids in the class. I made friends that I never thought I would and I had that sense of community that I loved about my first school. And on top of that, getting to hear these veteran stories and the civilians, it has been so humbling to me to be able to listen to their stories and hear their experiences and I've learned to appreciate what I have. After one of the interviews I sat in on, I went home and I had to sit and really appreciate all that I have and listening to their stories and listening to these experiences, it's humbling. Bob, I don't know how you handled going to school while your brothers were off at war, but I'm glad I got to hear your story.